Well, welcome to Waverton Evangelical Fellowship. My name is John Hosker and I'm one of the children and families workers here at the church and it's a privilege to lead you as we come together to worship God. Now Robin Gerard, our pastor, is away this week and we wish him and his family well. In his absence, it's my privilege to lead you as we come together to worship God. Whether this is your first episode with us, first service, or whether you've been watching these services over many weeks, whether you live locally, around Waveton and the village areas, or whether you live further afield, it matters not. We welcome you. We welcome you to our time together, and we hope you're going to get a lot from our time of worship. Now, as, as content goes, our services are a combination of Bible readings, prayers, some worship, some teaching and also an episode for our younger viewers called Sunday Club. We've been looking at some people in the Bible who were facing lockdown, were isolated, and looking at how those stories, how their situations speak to us today in our own form of lockdown, our own form of isolation. Some words from James chapter 4 before we come to sing to God. James chapter 4 verse 8 says these words, come near to God and he will come near to you. It's God's promise to all of us. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Let me pray before we sing together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your promise that as we choose to come near to you, as we choose to come to worship you, you promise to come near to us. Thank you, that's true. Amen. Just not 
This story is called Dark and Damp and Deep. Daniel helped the mighty king with any problem he might bring. He gave advice on everything the king would set before him. But Daniel had some enemies, overwhelmed with jealousy, who made an evil plan to see if they could trap and kill him. The den was dark and damp and deep. The lions growled, roared and leaped. But Daniel got a good night's sleep, for God was in there with him. Let's make a law to plainly say that to the king we all must pray. And then when Daniel disobeys, our chance will come to catch him. For anyone who breaks the law will end up in the lion's paws, crushed between the lion's jaws. And that will surely end him. The den was dark and damp and deep. The lions growled and roared and leaped. But Daniel got a good night's sleep, for God was in there with him. So off they went to see the king, and he agreed to everything. It made him proud to think they bring their sacred prayers before him. But then, when Daniel disobeyed and bowed his head to God and prayed, the king was sad and so dismayed, for he would have to kill him. The den was dark and damp and deep. The lions growled and roared and leaped. But Daniel got a good night's sleep, for God was in there with him. So, in the den, poor Daniel dropped. The lions roared and licked their chops. And then quite suddenly they stopped and someone came to save him. It was an angel, bright and white, who gave the lions such a fright. He shut their mouths, he shut them tight, while Daniel sat and watched him. The den was dark and damp and deep. The lions growled and roared and leaped. But Daniel got a good night's sleep, for God was in there with him. And when the king called down next day, Daniel answered back to say that God had answered when he prayed and found a way to save him. The king was thrilled, and so he said, Bring Daniel up, he is not dead. Drop down his enemies instead and let the lions eat them. The den was dark and damp and deep. The lions growled and roared and leaped. But Daniel got a good night's sleep, for God was in there with him. So for today's craft, we're going to be making a lion like the one here. You'll need a piece of paper, a bowl, some orange paint, a pen, some googly eyes, prit stick and a fork. So first off, take your piece of paper and your bowl and draw a circle round it with your pen to create the lion's head. Then you can take your googly eyes and stick them on, but you don't need googly eyes, you could draw, draw them with a pen. Then using your pen, make a little nose and a mouth on the lion and I also added some whiskers. Then take your fork and the orange paint and start printing around the edge with your fork to create the lion's mane. You could use red paint, yellow paint, orange paint, whatever colour paint you want, um, but I just did one layer like this. And that's your lion. Ours are a bit more friendly than the lions in Daniel's den.
the centuries I've known and trusted you And everyone could sing the endless song About the wonderful things you do Choices. We're going to let the hippos eat. 
We're going to count them down from five, four, three, two, one. You ready? Make your choice which hippo. Five, four, three, two, one. Go, hippos! Here we go. Oh, come on, green. You're struggling there. Come on, pink. Come on, orange. Come on, yellow hippo. Yellow, you're doing well. Come on, orange. Catch it up a bit. Come on, guys. Keep eating. Keep eating. Come on. You can do this. Yes! It's the yellow hippo. If you pick the yellow hippo, he was the greediest hippo, the hungriest hippo. Well, like the hippos, all of us can get hungry and greedy for things. We can, whatever those things are. And Daniel knew that too. But Daniel, in our story today, knew the most important, the most important thing to be hungry for was his God. The most important one to worship was God. Nothing else was as important. No King Darius, not food, not reputation, not career, not money. Nothing else was important to him other than his God. And that's an important lesson for us today, boys and girls, adults, parents, family. The most important lesson for us today is to remember that God needs to be first. And in our rhyming Bible story we watched and heard earlier, this is the last the last verse. The den was dark and damp and deep. The lions growled and roared and leaped. But Daniel got a good night's sleep, for God was in there with him. That's the only way he was able to sleep at night, in that lion's den. Yes, there was an angel helping, but he knew God was with him. He knew God was with him. And I pray now, I'm going to pray now for you, that you will know that God's with you. Keep following him. And know that he is with you in the things you face, wherever you go. Let me pray for you to finish Sunday Club. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are with us. You are with us wherever we go, wherever we face. And even when there are things that we get worried about or we're fearful of, Lord, we follow you, we trust you, we serve you, we worship you, and we know you'll keep us safe and you promise to be with us. Amen. See you soon. Bye.
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the great privilege we have of coming into your presence now. You are the living God who endures forever. Establish your kingdom in our midst, we pray. Thank you that through our Lord Jesus Christ, you have rescued and saved us. You are our Lord and we can call you Father. We ask for your forgiveness for those things we have said and done or left unsaid and undone this week when we have given way to fear and taken our eyes off you. In these times of uncertainty, we all need faith more than ever. Please grant us the gift of faith as we bring our concerns to you, knowing that you will hear and have mercy. You are the same God who kept Daniel from harm in the lion's den. You are with us all the time. We pray for our government and all those in positions of authority across the world for wisdom and guidance in the decisions they have to make. For our Christian brothers and sisters who suffer because of their love for Jesus, for your protection over them, your strength and peace. For church leaders across the world as churches begin to reopen and services are held, but without the freedoms we used to enjoy and took for granted. How we long to sing your praises together, Lord. How much longer will it be? Grant us patience. Help us to be contented with our time spent with you and when we can see and speak to each other. We are grateful for technology, which enables us to communicate. Please bless those who are seeking you for the first time or turning back to you after a time away. We bring to you those who are bereaved and grieving at this time. We ask that they will know your comfort and sense you holding them close. We pray for those who are unwell, hoping to receive the treatment they need. Please restore them to full health very soon, Lord. We ask for your protection from the coronavirus. We pray for those who are in hospital and who are recovering from it. For those researching into a cure and developing a vaccine. For those who've lost their jobs and businesses and are fearful for the future, please provide for their needs and guide them. And we thank you for the furlough scheme, which has benefited many. We remember those who are lonely and isolated. We ask for times of rest and refreshment for those who are able to have a holiday from work, for children after such a long absence from school and their parents juggling homeschooling with working from home. Give them love and patience. We thank you for our virtual holiday club and other Christian on online activities. May there be positive benefits for families emerging from these difficult times. We ask that we will be able to reflect on this time as one in which we were able to grow closer to you and encourage others to do the same. We pray that we may be a people who have faith, who hold out hope to others and show them your love. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. This is Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel 6. Darius reorganised his kingdom. He appointed 120 governors to administer all the parts of his realm. Over them were three vice-regents, one of whom was Daniel. The governors reported to the vice-regents, who made sure that everything was in order for the king. But Daniel, brimming with spirit and intelligence, so completely outclassed the other vice-regents and governors that the king decided to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. The vice-regents and the governors got together to find some old scandal or skeleton in Daniel's life that they could use against him, but they couldn't dig up anything. He was totally exemplary and trustworthy. They could find no evidence of negligence or misconduct. So they finally gave up and said, we're never going to find anything against this Daniel unless we cook up something religious. The vice regents and governors conspired together and then went to the king and said, King Darius, live forever. We've convened your vice regents, governors and all your leading officials and have agreed that the king should issue the following decree. For the next 30 days, no one is to pray to any god or mortal except you, O king. Anyone who disobeys will be thrown into the lion's den. Issue this decree, O king, and make it unconditional, as if written in stone like all the laws of the Medes and the Persians. King Darius signed the decree. When Daniel learned that the decree had been signed and posted, he continued to pray, just as he had always done. His house had windows in the upstairs that opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he knelt there in prayer, thanking and praising his God. The conspirators came and found him praying, asking God for help. They went straight to the king and reminded him of the royal decree that he had signed. Did you not, they said, sign a decree forbidding anyone to pray to any god or man except you for the next thirty days, and anyone caught doing it would be thrown into the lion's den? Absolutely, said the king, written in stone like all the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Then they said, Daniel, one of the Jewish exiles, ignores you, O king, and defies your decree. Three times a day he prays. At this the king was very upset and tried his best to get Daniel out of the fix he'd put him in. He worked at it the whole day long. But the conspirators were back. Remember, O king, it's the law of the Medes and the Persians that the king's decree can never be changed. The king caved in and ordered Daniel brought and thrown into the lion's den. But he said to Daniel, your God to whom you are so loyal is going to get you out of this. A stone slab was placed over the opening of the den. The king sealed the cover with his signet ring and the signet ring of all his nobles, fixing Daniel's fate. The king then went back to his palace. He refused supper. He couldn't sleep. He spent the night fasting. At daybreak, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. As he approached the den, he called out anxiously, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve so loyally, saved you from the lions? O king, live forever, said Daniel. My God sent his angel who closed the mouths of the lions so that you would not hurt me. I've been found innocent before God and also before you, O king. I've done nothing to harm you. When the king heard these words, he was happy. He ordered Daniel taken up out of the den. When he was hauled up, there wasn't a scratch on him. He had trusted his God. Then the king commanded that the conspirators who had informed on Daniel be thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. Before they hit the floor, the lions had them in their jaws, tearing them to pieces. King Darius published this proclamation to every race, colour and creed on earth. Peace to you, abundant peace. I decree that Daniel's God shall be worshipped and feared in all parts of my kingdom. He is the living God, world without end. His kingdom never fails. His rule continues eternally. He is the saviour and rescuer. He performs astonishing miracles in heaven and on earth. He saved Daniel from the power of the lions. From then on, Daniel was treated well during the reign of Darius and also in the following reign of Sirius. Persian. 
This is another of those passages and accounts that, if we're not too careful, can be relegated to being left for children. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament provides a couple of really powerful stories that so many people have heard of, but we risk not having a full understanding of what happened unless we examine them properly. We'll be doing that this morning. But before diving into the detail of chapter 6, we need to take a moment to understand where we are in context. If Robin was here, he would remind us, as he did last week, that the first part of uh, the most important thing to do in reading the Bible is firstly to understand the context. The book of Daniel starts in 587 BC with the siege of Jerusalem and the Judean king Jehoiakim being defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. The Babylonians were seen uh, as being the enemy of God's people and they took treasure from the temple and took a number of Israelites with them back to Babylon. Chapter 1 and verse 4 describes them as young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. Daniel was one of these men who were trained and prospered in this time. 114 says that they were not equal to Daniel and his three compatriots. At times, too, if we're honest, we can feel as though we've been carried off to a foreign land with strange customs and rules we don't recognise. Reading through the book of Daniel, it's clear to see God's hand on Daniel's life, giving him wisdom, providing sustenance, and enabling him to serve three kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Balthazar, and Darius. This is no mean feat in itself, as new kings and leaders often dispense with the administrators of the previous regime. It would have been hard for Daniel and his Israelite companions to settle in an alien land with pagan customs, whilst remaining faithful to God, uh, to the God of their fathers. It's easier to do this together and share that experience, and yes, that is another good example of why life groups are so helpful. We could, if we're all honest, spend a few weeks looking at this passage, but we won't. There are simply three things that we'll have a look at this morning. And the first is this. Daniel obeyed God. Daniel had a choice when the edict was made. He could obey this temporary law to bow down and pray only to King Darius. Or he could obey his God, the one true God. Verse 10 gives us the answer. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, as he had done before. When given the choice, Daniel obeyed God, not the law, the land. Although, if I'm being honest, I might not have done it quite so brazenly and openly as he did, but maybe there's a lesson in there for us. We can think that all we have to do is obey God and defy the law of the land in secret, but there may be times when we have to do this openly in public. This wasn't the first time that uh, Daniel chose following God and obeying God rather than obeying the law. Uh, As we saw earlier in the book, over whether Daniel and his companions ate the food that had been offered to sacrifices or not, uh, sacrifice to idols or not. Daniel obeyed God even though he was fully aware of the consequences that he would be facing. How does that play out for us? We may think that Daniel sets an incredibly high standard in obeying God, and there is some truth to this. But he also sets us an example to follow, in that Daniel was wholehearted in his severe devotion and his service to God. It begs the question for us as to whether we are wholehearted in our obedience to God or whether there are some areas that we're happy to go our own way in. You see, we follow God on his terms, not on ours. This is binary. We follow or we don't. There is no middle ground. We can say that we obey God on the big things, no murdering, no stealing, no speaking ill of uh, others. Um, We give to church and we give to those in need. But how does that extend? to every area of our life. The things we watch or listen to or read, the choices about where and how we spend our money, gossiping about others, not doing the good we're asked to, not talking about Jesus when we have the chance. 
Is that really obeying God's call in our lives? Where are you not obeying God? That he's now bringing to mind that you need to sort out. So Daniel obeyed God. Secondly, Daniel trusted God. The details on what happened in the lion's den are scant. And to be honest, we don't need to know them. In a moment of idle speculation, you might wonder about what was going in there all night. Many illustrators and artists have had a go, and there are some examples around that you will have seen. We know that from verse 21 that God shut up the mouths of the lions, and given Daniel's other habits, I think it's reasonable to speculate he'd have spent the night in prayer. I also wouldn't be surprised if he spent a lot of it asleep, as he was so calm and peaceful about what was happening. Verse 25 explains to us why. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. It's not a pleasant sight to watch lions eat, if you've ever done that at the zoo. And I suspect it wasn't a pleasant sight when Daniel's accusers were thrown in and eaten. This proved beyond all doubt that the lions had been hungry. Daniel had trusted in his God. It's possible that he had words from Proverbs in his mind as he was in that den all night. Trust in the Lord with your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. We can think that's what Proverbs say. But those eagle of our aid amongst you, and I hope that there are some, will notice the deliberate omission of one word. It should be this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Did you spot the error? I hope so. If we're not careful, we can allow ourselves to think that we know what the Bible says, but actually not know in practice. In this instance, like Daniel, we're to trust with all our heart and in all our ways submit to him not just the ones we want to. In your mind, draw a picture of a heart now. If I was to ask you how much you trusted God, where would that line go in your heart? Would it be a majority? A super majority? Or no line at all? Which areas of your life are in that part that you don't trust God for? This may be for countless reasons. Pain, Past hurt, rejection, uh, thinking we know better than God, lack of confidence. But the Bible is clear that we need to work through those and trust God. You know, it's natural to have doubts. The key thing is what you do with them. The disciple Thomas did not keep his doubt to himself, but spoke them out. Jesus heard him and showed him his nail pieced um, hands. If you have doubts and you're trusting in God, speak to them, the man to him in prayer. You might also find it helpful to talk to somebody about it so that you can, they can pray with you as well. But the purpose of this is to increase our trust in God. To get a point to a point like Daniel when we can show that we trust with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Are we willing to take the next step on that journey for us? And then thirdly, Darius, not Daniel, but Darius was caught out by his ego and his vanity. You know, there's times when we allow ourselves to get swept away by praise and thinking too much of ourselves. And King Darius is certainly guilty of this in this chapter. Darius knew about Daniel and his abilities, and I suspect as well he knew about his worship of the one true God. But Darius allowed himself to be persuaded to introduce this law, which was born of the jealousy and envy from the other administrators. Darius's sin was in thinking people could pray to him like a god, appealing to his vanity and his ego. I dare say he didn't stop to think um, whether people would do this, uh, why people would do this, or the malice that accompanied their actions. How often do we pause? I wanted to consider the motives of others. They may not be as pure as we think they are. 
How in check is our ego and our vanity and our sense of self? We're reminded in the Bible that we need to keep humility at the forefront of who we are and what we do, as if we do not, we'll end up in trouble. Darius came to his senses after Daniel had been rescued from the lions and had a change of heart. But this ego-led decree led to the deaths of Daniel's accusers and their families. Actions have consequences. Are we going to come to our sense and acknowledge God? Daniel 6, verses 26 and 27 says this, For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs miracles, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. I wonder this morning if you can say that too. So three questions out of this famous account for us to consider. How are you at obeying God? How are you at trusting God? And how are you at ignoring your ego? So that's the question for us this morning. How are we going to obey God? How are we going to trust God? And how are we going to remain humble and not be distracted by our own ego? Because if we're all honest, we all find this hard. None of us are perfect. We all find obeying God, trusting God, and remaining humble difficult at times. There's some times when it's better than others, and that's perfectly natural and understandable. But God invites us to obey him completely. God obeys, asks us to trust him, to trust with all our hearts. And God invites us to put him first, not considering our own ego. Maybe as we've been reflecting this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever you're listening to this, maybe God's just prompting a couple of areas of, those li of your life where you don't obey him at the moment. He's saying, come on, here's, here's an area where you need to obey. Maybe there's an area that you're not trusting him for. Or maybe there's some people or some circumstances or situations when your ego is running wild and you're not remaining humble and putting it first. Now's the time, just in a few moments of quiet, simply to pray. Ask for God's forgiveness and ask for strength and help to obey him, to trust him, and to remain humble. Maybe you've never come to know God. Maybe you've maybe you've never said sorry for those things you've done wrong. And you've been prompted this morning to do so. The Bible talks about repentance, this 180 degree turn, where instead of going our own way, we go God's way. The analogy that we take our hands off the steering wheel and we ask God to take control of the steering wheel of our lives. It's a very simple thing to do. It has profound consequences, it has eternal consequences, but it allows us to come and do that. And if that's you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, I'd invite you please to do that. And join us as we pray together. Father God, thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the stories that are in it and the truth that is contained there. And we're sorry, Lord, when we don't obey you, when we don't do those things that you ask us to do. Forgive us and please give us the strength to obey you in the future by your Spirit. For those areas we find it hard to trust you, Lord, I pray that we would work through that with you. You know that we have doubts. Help us to work through those doubts and to strengthen our faith. And forgive us when we think too much of ourselves, 
when we should be putting you first and remaining humble. Help us to bow our knee and to acknowledge you. And if you are at the point of wanting to come to know God for the first time, simply say, I'm sorry, Lord, for those things I've done wrong when I've wanted to do things myself. Please forgive me for those things and help me to live in the right way. Help me to follow you. Help me to be obedient to you. Lord, you've got a great plan for me. Help me to have the strength to live out that plan, that calling that you've placed on me. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time and you want to get in touch with us, it'd be great. Please do so uh, via the website. If you'd like someone to pray with you for something that God's prompted you, and please get in contact with us. There's plenty of people, whether it's John, myself, or Robin, uh, would be lo uh, love to pray with you in all of that as we seek to live out God's calling on our lives together. The story of Daniel that we've heard today, we've been thinking about, such a familiar story to all of us. And it's a story which reminds us of our need to be faithful, to say that we'll be faithful and to do faithfulness. It's an active activity. And Daniel really was someone who showed that through his life. He wasn't prepared to bow to the king, to King Darius, because he spent his time bowing to the king, King Jesus, his Lord and Saviour. God himself and it's important to remember for our own selves that just when we think we've cracked faithfulness we can face a challenge or a situation where we need to hold fast hold firm to, and be faithful ourselves to reaffirm our faithfulness to the living God to refuse to bow to any other king any other any other God because God of God's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He is the one that we serve. He is the one we remain faithful to. We've also been reminding ourselves this morning of the need to obey God, to follow his commands, to follow what he thinks about something and not obey other, other beliefs, other decisions, other ways. Also to trust God when we don't know the future or don't know the present, when things are changing around us and there are questions and decisions to be made to trust that God has us. God has us safe. God has us secure. Promises to be with us. Promises to look after us. So we don't need to live in fear. We live in faith. And also, we've been reminded to ignore our ego, which is a challenge for all of us because we've all got one. We've all got, we've all got ways of being, ways of living, ways of of thinking on lots of things which at times is challenging when we make decisions in a community when we're in a family when we're with our friends and we need to respect what they think and above all respect what God thinks which is far more important his ego than ours you've had as I've had an opportunity today to respond to this message and we hope you've been able to do that now, if there are things that you'd like to uh, discuss, questions you'd like to talk to someone about, or you'd like someone to pray for you, we're really happy and we'd be delighted to offer that to you. Please get in touch through the website or through email. I'd be happy to pray with you, as other people in our, our church family would be also happy to do that. Shall we... Uh, Shall we finish by the grace, by, sorry, by saying the grace together? But before I do, let me just read to you um, three or four verses from Proverbs chapter 3. Pro Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 say these words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path, paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. Hallelujah. Let's 
say the grace together, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.